Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, a couple of announcements first. This is the last energy seminar of the quarter, but it's a really, really good one. So I'm really glad uh, uh, to have the team here to do this uh, presentation. Uh, secondly, I'd like to acknowledge Homes Homo. We actually tried to get this team a year ago when they issued their first report and failed miserably, Rachel uh, Madison and myself. And Homes Homo figured out that they were going to be back this week and kind of arranged the whole thing uh, amongst a, a couple of other stops for the team. So thank you once again, Homes. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce uh, to introduce today's speaker, once again, the director of the Precourt Institute for Energy, Professor William Chu. Will. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Uh, it's great to see everyone. And what a treat today. Um, I'm always very fond of finding catalysts uh, among us, and David is certainly one of them, uh, who has brought us together and has an incredible schedule today. And uh, Thank you, Dave, for coming directly from Baku, from COP29. Only 12 time zones away. 12 time zones away. And, uh, and I hope you'll cover some of the frontline learnings. Um, you know, it's a real pleasure and really wonderful timing to be talking about, I think, one of the most timely topic, really the intersection of climate, energy, and AI. And... It was such a great time that David is coming to Stanford to talk about this new report on the um, artificial intelligence for climate change mitigation roadmap, and also to lecture in our scaling sustainability solution class just uh, 10 minutes ago. So let me say a few words about the report. I haven't had the chance to read all, I think, 300 some pages of it, um, but glancing some of the important section, it really occurred to me that AI is coupled with climate and sustainability in countless ways, whether it's the use of energy for AI, all the way to how AI might accelerate the solutions and everything in between. Such a complex set of couplings, which I think today's presentation and discussion will reveal. Uh, let me briefly introduce our distinguished speakers uh, today and lead authors of this very important report, the second edition. So David Sandalo is uh, visiting us from Columbia University, where he is the inaugural fellow at the Center of Global Energy Policy. And he's also the co-director of the Energy and Environment Concentration at the School of International and Public Affairs. Prior to Columbia, he has a long distinguished career in government, uh, where uh, he served as the Under Secretary of um, Energy and the Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs at the DOE. He has also served multiple positions uh, in the White House and the State Department. And there are so many things to highlight. And actually, Holmes uh, put together a couple of these uh, first for David. Uh, when he was working with Secretary Stephen Chu, who is also on our faculty, he launched the Clean Energy Ministerial, where he brought together all the various energy ministers in the key economies. And this is really a beginning of international cooperation. And this is now, I think, the 15th year nice. since its creation. You know, we talk about critical minerals a lot here. Uh, and actually, uh, David started some of those discussions by directing the first study of the global reserves of transition metals needed for the clean energy supply chain. And this is this international and global interest is reflected in the report as well. And next, I will briefly introduce uh, Julio Freeman as well. And uh, he's currently a fellow at the Center also for Global Energy Policy at Columbia. Um, previously, he was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Fossil Energy uh, under Obama, where he was responsible for the nation's R&D program uh, on advanced fossil energy systems. And he's a longtime uh, scientist and leader at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, um, just across the bay, where he was the chief energy technologist. So welcome, Julio, as well. And um, last but not least, it's our pleasure to welcome uh, Alb Kuchikabir, who is an adjunct professor of computer science at Columbia and leads the entrepreneurship efforts for climate change. So we at Stanford, at the Door School, at the Precourt Institute, are very excited to welcome 
these three leading um, thought leaders to talk about this very timely, opportunistic, and also challenging intersection of sustainability, climate, energy, and AI. So without further ado, a round of applause for our guest. Thank you, Will. I'm excited and honored to be here. It's just great to be here at Stanford and experience all the incredible intellectual uh, fervor that's happening here on these issues. Um, we're going to give you a, a briefing on our report for I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes and then throw it open for discussion, comments, and questions, because I know there's enormous talent uh, in this audience, and we really want to have a discussion more than just talk at, talk at you. It's really fun to be here. It's fun for me to see a couple of old friends in the audience. I want to I want to acknowledge Holmes Hummel, who uh, did an amazing job organizing this day. So thank you, Holmes. And so I, I hired Holmes 15 years ago at the US Department of Energy. I certainly have never made a better hire in my life, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, un unbelievable. And basically from the time I hired Holmes, she, I did whatever she told me to do. Uh, and it ended up being a really, really good strategy. And so Stanford is incredibly fortunate to have Holmes here. Uh, Stanford is also incredibly fortunate to have Dave Hayes here. Dave, who a friend of many years, former twice, twice Deputy Secretary of the Interior, um, and thank you, Dave, for coming. Um, but but not just, uh, but a real thought leader on energy environment policy in the United States. Um, so this um, is a little bit of an experiment. This is like we released this report a few days ago in Baku, um, and this is, I guess, now the third time we've spoken about it. So we're kind of uh, learning as we go along. Um, the the report. It's got 25 co-authors, some of whom are listed here. Uh, and it's the second edition of report. We, we did the first edition, as John referred to, um, uh, last year. And the question of the report is, how can AI help reduce emissions of greenhouse gases? That's the core question that we are asking. AI is this incredibly powerful tool that's gotten stratospheric levels of attention since ChatGPT came out two years ago. The question we look at is, how can AI help reduce emissions of greenhouse gases? Um, in this second edition, we have 17 chapters. Um, we wanted in the second edition to do more than just talk about possibilities. We wanted to propose ways to actually take action. And so every chapter has five to 10 specific actionable recommendations. So in total, over 100 recommendations are in this report. And each one is key to specific stakeholders. Each one starts with a, a subject like government, philanthropies, universities, what they can do. Um, and uh, and goes on uh, from there. And it's available online in these three places. We're actually getting a version of it up on Amazon for sales of hardback copies, and some people like to absorb it that way. Um, uh, if it, The first two websites here, you can download individual chapters uh, as well as the entire 334-page PDF. Um, here's the table of contents. Just quickly, we start with introductions to AI and to climate change. Our goal is to help inform people who may not be experts in either of these topics, as well as to provide a technical level of detail that'll be helpful for, for even for experts. We look at eight different sectors, which you can see here. And you might, I, I'm curious, you might just pause for a moment and I wonder how many people here are working in any of these sectors. Do any of these sectors relate to what you're doing? And if so, you might might find this interesting. Um, and then we have cross-cutting topics. We have, a, I think, a very interesting article written by a natural language processing expert on large language models and broadly speaking, what they might do to fight climate change, greenhouse gas emissions monitoring, materials innovation, and these other topics um, that you see. Um, so we have, we have lots and lots of detail in this report. We decided, particularly for press consumption and broader consumption, important to really distill this down into five key takeaways. And Julio and Alp and our two other kind of lead co-authors spent a lot of time in July and August, I think, kind of trying to figure out what are our main messages. And here, here's what we decided the main messages are at a pretty high level of generality. Um, the first, AI has significant potential to make, or to make contributions to climate change mitigations in the years ahead. Kind of start right there. It, it has a lot of potential mm -hmm. to make a difference, both incremental gains, such as improving efficiencies, 
it's already happening, and then transformational gains, uh, particularly I think in the area of materials innovation, that's one pretty exciting area. There's transformational gains, I think, in greenhouse gas monitoring as well, and we'll come back and talk about these. A second key takeaway is that greenhouse gas emissions from computing operations for AI are today less than 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions and probably a lot less than 1% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and that, I think, is a little bit contrary to the media narrative on this, to the extent there isn't. I, mean, I think we see a lot, I've at least seen a number of articles starting to equate or even equating AI with crypto um, and suggesting that there mass, there could be, there's mass, big power demand and massive greenhouse gas emissions from AI. I spent a fair amount of time this summer digging into the literature on this. And, and I think, at least to the extent the literature um, exists today on this, and it's, uh, I, I think that undoubtedly it, the 1% is an upper bound today. Um, but as this says, it's very likely to increase in the near future because we have AI power, a, demand for AI is increasing uh, significantly. The efficiency of hardware and software is increasing as well, but demand is increasing, use is increasing, and so it's likely to increase. And in the long run, it is quite unclear whether AI will be a good thing or a bad thing for greenhouse gas emissions. You can construct scenarios where AI ends up significantly decreasing overall greenhouse gas emissions, but you can construct scenarios where the opposite is true. So if that's the case, if we have the potential to use AI to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, what are the barriers to that? They're, the two principal barriers are lack of data and lack of trained personnel, and we get into a fair amount of detail on that in different sectors. A fourth key point is that trust in AI systems is essential. There's no way that AI can realize its potential to do good unless it is trusted. And there are enormous barriers to trusting AI right now. There's concerns about bias, privacy, mis- and disinformation, safety, security issues. And as you think about AI and its potential to do good, it's really important to think about all those concerns and how they can be addressed. And then a final key takeaway is that every organization with a role in climate change mitigation should consider opportunities for AI to contribute to its work. That's not happening now, I think, but NGOs, government ministries, um, certainly businesses, every organization should at least be considering opportunities for AI to contribute. Um, so we're, we don't have time to cover all 17 chapters without putting you to sleep, uh, but we're going to cover uh, a few of them, starting with our chapter on introduction to AI, which was written by Dr. Kuchu Kelber, yeah, thank you. otherwise known as Al. Yes, you can definitely cover that. Um, all right, so pleasure to be here, and uh, given that it's kind of coming to the Close to the end of the day, and we have a, a slightly dark room. Let's uh, let's try to make this a little bit uh, interactive. So, how many of you here are computer scientists by training? Show of hands. Okay. Uh, how many of you have at least visited OpenAI's website, ChatGPT, and tried it once? Okay. So the distinction there was like two percent to ninety-eight percent. Mm -hmm. And um, so AI clearly is, is proliferating and, and, and really taking over, um, capturing the imagination of uh, all of us, right? Not just the computer scientists. Um, so what I'd like to do here is just take two slides to describe a little bit about how we think about AI and um, think about the different uh, patterns that we're going to be highlighting as we go through the different sectors and talk about applications of AI in mitigating climate change in those specific sectors. So the first is a definition. Uh, there are many definitions of AI. Ours is, it's the science of making computers perform complex tasks. And the important thing here is that AI is a type of software. We've had software for many years. So the main difference between AI and traditional software, which powers so much of our economy, is that instead of relying on explicit programming, specifically telling the computer to do certain things under specific conditions, AI relies on historical data and simulation to so-called train itself and learn patterns. So you can see language around intelligence creeping into how AI is described, the main difference being that it relies on data. That's why we highlight data as being a critical barrier, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Now, modern AI has far-reaching capabilities. Um, I'm just going to highlight four of them, and I'd like to, as I go through, see if there's a kind of resonance uh, uh, with these. So one thing that AI can do is it can detect patterns in data. 
So an example here might be facial recognition. If you've uh, traveled uh, recently and gone through TSA, uh, you have the option to not even show your ID, right? We're recognizing and using facial recognition here. Um, so how many of you have used AI or machine learning to detect something interesting in, in data before? Just a show of hands. Okay. So, so, so there's, you know, more, I would say maybe 50 to 60% of you understand that, that AI has the capability of finding these patterns from data. That's good. Now, another thing that AI can do is it can make predictions. So technically, when we think about ChatGPT, what it's doing is it's underneath the hood predicting what the next word should be as it strings a sequence of words as a response to a query that you provide. Um, other very common ideas around prediction is forecasting, just forecasting what the weather might look like or where the market might go. So how many of you have thought about machine learning or AI in a prediction context? Just a show of hands. Interesting. More than detection. Okay, yeah, more than detection. It's a very kind of fundamental um, aspect of, of machine learning. Um, another thing that AI can do is uh, optimize. So the idea here is not simply to make a forecast or a prediction of what will happen when you have specific conditions or inputs, but rather to say, I have a goal. I want to get from point A to point B. I can use machine learning to predict how long it's going to take me to do that if I drive in different routes. But what Google Maps does is it optimizes over those routes. So it uses a machine learning model underneath the hood, but gives you an answer that is the shortest in time even if, it's the, if it isn't the shortest in distance, taking into account things like traffic. So how many of you have thought about or used AI for optimization? Okay, all right. So slightly decreasing, and that's expected. This is a little bit more of a high value add. Um, and finally, what AI can do is it can simulate. So the example that we have here is video games because you might uh, have, have followed the um, AlphaGo um, uh, news item a few years ago where uh, this was the first time that we built a computer program uh, that beat the top Go player uh, in the world, and, and this achievement was achieved in, in chess many, many, many years ago. Um, now, this is video games, so you or not video games, games in general, but video games as well, where you simulate many, many, many thousands, if not millions of possible outcomes and use the result of that to inform your algorithms. This it turns out is one of the transformational abilities of AI, especially when we talk about specific use cases like material science innovation. So we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail going forward. So if I now move forward, we have four examples here in climate. So an example of detection might be detecting methane e emissions from satellite data, predicting weather, as I mentioned, Optimization, you know, the power grid is uh, an opportunity for actually figuring out what is the optimal power flow under various conditions. And simulation can lead to discoveries in, again, material science. Here we have an example from battery chemistry. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it back or over to Julio to a brief intro on climate change. Let's do this here. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, you are here. This is bad news. We basically know that climate change is real. It's man-made. It's bad. Um, everything else, you know, since then is the question has been, well, what do we do about it? Um, it turns out that's a team sport. Everybody gets to think about how to, how to fix this particular problem. But, but we don't really understand I mean, we, we understand that the specific challenge quite a lot. Combination of greenhouse gases, most importantly, carbon dioxide, but, but a bunch of others, uh, warm the atmosphere. This was first discovered actually in 1850 by Eunice Foote. Uh, and has, since then, uh, we've continued to polish that sort of result. Um, this is kind of our home three years ago. Uh, we're not cavalier about this in California between droughts and fires and floods and other kinds of things. We see quite a lot of this. Um, it's really a question, uh, though, not of flux. It's really a question of stocks. Really, it's not how much do we emit in a year. It's how much does it accumulate in the atmosphere. Once these things get in the atmosphere, they're there for a long time. CO2's residence time is on the order of many hundreds of years. 
And so uh, the more we emit today, the more we, we suffer tomorrow. Um, and this is also not lost on anybody. Uh, the hottest July on record was this July. The hottest year on record was last year. The hottest 10 years of human history have been the last 10 years. There's no sort of mystery around this as, as a challenge. Um, so the question again becomes, you know, what do you do? Uh, we really took a comprehensive look this edition at trying to cover as many sectors as possible, as many cross-cutting issues as possible. Uh, we simply do not have the time to go through all of this laboriously, but we're going to get a couple of highlights here. Uh, as David said, and we'll pick up from this particular moment, uh, we in each case make specific recommendations. We urge you to go into the report, and, and if you see anything in those chapters where you're like, hey, that seems interesting, we got we got specifics in there in terms of, usually a chapter has some 120 references and a dozen recommendations. So there's, there's good stuff to do. Over to David again. Uh, thank you. And, and by the way, our, uh, our chapter on climate change, introduction to climate change, we really honored the lead author of that chapter is Ho Sung Lee, who was the immediate past chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So we really honored that he would join our team and, and write on it. Um, so we're just going to talk about a few chapters. And I think one of the most important is chapter on the power sector. Um, and it's important because of the importance of the power sector to decarbonization, which is I think probably familiar to people in this room, 28% of greenhouse gas emissions today, but even more important, any deep decarbonization strategy depends upon electrification in many different sectors. So if we're going to achieve net zero emissions, achieve our climate goals, we need to grow the power sector as we decarbonize the power sector, which is a huge challenge. And to do that, we need innovative tools. And, and what we're looking at is, can AI be helpful in, in that venture? Um, a first observation is I, I, AI is actually already helping uh, decarbonize the power sector. Uh, machine learning tools are helping optimize the location of transmission and generation assets. I think um, inciting solar and wind plants, inciting transmission lines right now, uh, AI tools are being used for optimization. Um, and then they're also being used at solar and wind farms to increase output, actually, with weather data. Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you have a good beat on, on weather in the short term, solar cover or, or solar and, and wind, uh, it can help optimize the output from your solar and wind farm. And there's pretty good data on 10 or 15 percent type improvements from current AI tools at wind farms and solar farms using AI tools in the past couple of years. Uh, but AI can do much more. I think one of the one of the exciting applications is in transmission, what's called dynamic line rating. Um, and uh, you have to be very conservative in putting lots of electricity through an emission through a transmission line. Electricity is very dangerous. Um, and so um, uh, historically, only a, a limited amount of electricity has been able to go through a line. If you put sensors on that line, that measure temperature, that measure wind speed, you can generate data which allows you to evaluate whether conditions are sufficient to increase the amount of electricity safely. And that's happening, but that technology depends utterly on AI tools to evaluate that data because you're putting out so much data from the sensors that you couldn't, a human being couldn't just sit there and evaluate it. You need AI tools. So AI tools for dynamic line rating are increasing the flow through of uh, on transmission lines by. 30 or 40 percent in some experiments. This can make a big difference in places where we're transmission constrained and we're we're not able to get renewable power to load centers because the transmission, the inability to build new transmission, if you can increase the capacity by 30 or 40 percent, that makes a big difference. Uh, we, we need better optimal power flow analysis and and uh, AI is critical there. And, and uh, virtual power plants is an exciting place too. That's for those who aren't familiar with the terminology, that virtual power plants refers to distributed collections of demand response capability and energy storage capability, being able to gather those all together. And instead of, for example, instead of building a new natural gas turbine to supply power it during a period of peak usage, pool together demand response resources and energy storage resources and do that instead. And this too depends upon AI tools to evaluate um, uh, all kinds of things. And, and, and with AI tools, we can do this and much more, I think, in the power sector. 
So what's preventing us from this? Uh, I, I think at least three things. Um, uh, first is a lack of standardized data and well-developed models. And there are there's enormous amount of data in utilities in the United States, particularly from, from meters. Uh, the utilities are keeping close hold. They have no motivation to release them and to release the data. In fact, the opposite. Um, and, and the lack of having accessible data means we can't train AI models or use AI models with that data. Um, a lack of trained personnel is a huge issue. We just don't have the people in the industry who know how to do this. And then utility business models are, are a huge challenge. A lot of places utilities are not incented to be innovative or to reduce energy. Um, so and I think it's a really important point that, that AI can do a lot of things. The technology um, can make a difference, but you need to get it into situations, into institutions where people have an incentive to use it in order for it to make a difference. Uh, every chapter of the roadmap also, we look at risks from the use of AI. Uh, and there, there are risks that are very significant in the power sector if you use AI in real-time operation. Um, you, you have to be very precise in managing electric grid. Electric generation has to, man has to match electric load. Uh, if you have any deviation on that, you can cause shortages, you can cause blackouts. Um, and so AI tools need to be very precise. And as people who, if everybody's used ChatGPT, we know about the hallucination issue. If you have a hallucination on ChatGPT, it's less of a problem than if you have a hallucination in managing electric grid, for example. So you have to be very careful on the safety protocols. And then we have a series of recommendations. Um, just as an illustration here, we recommend national governments, electricity regulators, and utilities should work together to develop data standards that it should also launch programs for training people in the power sector, and we need clear and better regulatory frameworks. So every chapter in the roadmap goes into depth like this. Um, we'll talk about a few chapters in a little bit less detail, turning it over to Alp, who wrote our manufacturing chapter. Thank you, David. Yeah, I'll, I'll go quite a bit fast. OK, uh, but I still want to make it slightly interactive. So uh, manufacturing is about one third of global emissions. Uh, the breakdown is steel is the largest offender, uh, then cement, then chemicals. Uh, but show of hands, how many of you have stepped foot in a steel mill? OK, not bad. All right. Um, so, so these are kind of magical places. They're kind of like Disneyland for adults, uh, as far as I'm concerned. There's like, you know, basically magma and, and just molten metal and, and fire and fury. Fury is just it's incredible. Anyhow, um, but a common thread across manufacturing is that manufacturing processes are very, quote, hard to abate, uh, primarily for two reasons. One is manufacturing processes frequently require sustained amounts of high heat. When I mean high heat, it's in the thousands of degrees, and I'm agnostic to whether you're a Celsius or a Fahrenheit person, thousands. Uh, some, like cement processing, um, actually directly emit CO2 as part of the chemistry. So, so at least historically how we've been making um, cement, uh, the chemical reaction itself directly um, emits CO2. Now, AI can help decarbonize manufacturing in three different ways. Uh, I'm going to show just one example from the first one, which is the uh, decarbonizing the direct process of making things. I'll give an example of how AI is uh, transformational in moving manufacturing towards a circular economy. Instead of thinking about linear production, uh, reusing materials for circular production. However, AI has fundamental uh, opportunities at the intersection of supply chain uh, and adopting dematerialization strategies, which was uh, a big topic of the last assessment report, the last assess the IPCC assessment report, as well as things like um, maintaining equipment. So let's talk about um, circular manufacturing very, very quickly. So um, AI has both incremental and transformational opportunities here. Uh, the transformational version is to move away from the top, where we mine virgin feedstock raw materials. Uh, we manufacture them. Uh, we might have some amount of recycled materials coming in. Those are variable in quantity and quality. We don't quite know what to do, so we apply a bunch of over-design, which is just bad practices like blending things together and over-processing materials. And then we get reliable products. That's good, like the steel that was used to build this building and the cement and the concrete and everything. Uh, but we generate waste and excess carbon. So the future needs to look like this. We're using mostly or only recycled feedstock, whether it's scrap metal or alternative materials for cement, uh, plastics, and basically plug that into a manufacturing plant and get reliable products. However, the variability and volatility of your recycled material, um, there's no real way of adapting to that 
unless you bring in a technology like AI, which can really help optimize the plant itself. So AI can help us adopt, uh, adapt to volatility faster, but more importantly, this use case is adapting to volatility better. It can now, in different ways, um, have a few other uh, use cases, which I'm going to put all on the page here. And maybe we just talk about um, the third one, because that is an example of detecting patterns from data. That's why it has the magnifying glass. Um, the workforce in manufacturing is retiring. Uh, this is where the expertise is. Um, every single uh, steel leader, cement manufacturer, chemicals producer I talk to is deeply concerned about the fact that none of you are going to work at those companies. Instead, all of you want to work at, you know, more exciting meta, open AI, so on and so forth, that they don't have the talent. So how do you get the person with two years of training on a you know, chemicals manufacturing plant to have the same level of expertise as someone who's been there for 20 years? Well, maybe we can mine all of the historical production data and really use AI to help assist that person be better at that job. There's a few interesting applications like that. Without going into more detail, I'll now pass it over to Julio for some carbon capture. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you've heard of carbon capture. Anybody here? Outstanding! That was not the case 10 years ago. Raise your hand if you've heard of carbon dioxide removal. That was not the case five years ago. I feel loved. Very nice. Um, it turns out the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is definitive about this now. About a seventh, 14% of the abatement is going to come from carbon management. Most of that's going to be point source capture and storage, but some of that's going to be CO2 removal from the air and oceans. By the way, the only way we get to net zero is by about 10 gigatons of removal. For scale, uh, the entire oil and gas industry is five gigatons. So we got to build a system that's twice as big as the oil and gas industry working in res reverse, and we got about 30 years to do it. Hey, maybe AI can help with that. My understanding is that uh, the uh, new School of Sustainability uh, has made some 16 awards, something like that, on carbon capture. I uh, don't know that any of them involve AI. Perhaps that's an opportunity for somebody in this room or somebody else out there. Uh, there's lots of ways they can do it. I'm big on new materials. Uh, Pulakesh is, I'm sure, familiar with that. This is something he spent a lot of time thinking about every day to day. But uh, uh, you can use uh, the, the simulation capabilities that Alp mentioned to identify new materials. You can also rank them out of the trillions of materials you can make. What are the 50,000 that work? What are the five you want to test? Good work for AI. Um, can you build new facilities and integrate them into existing facilities? Hell yes, digital twins are really good for this. Great AI tool. Uh, can you reduce the cost and risk and improve the performance? Absolutely, that's optimization put in with those simulation capabilities. You want to build transportation and storage networks, whether it's by train or by boat or by pipeline, the routing of these things, optimizing for cost, not just optimizing for cost, optimizing for avoiding environmentally sensitive areas, optimizing for equity and justice. There's lots of things you can do by building an objective function that delivers the goods. Uh, can you optimize the subsurface? Hell yes. Uh, those of you who are involved in subsurface work know that already oil and gas companies are pouring an enormous amount of money trying to optimize production of oil and gas and other kinds of hydrocarbons from the subsurface. Hey, perhaps it's possible that uh, you can use the same capabilities in reverse and optimize, uh, find good storage sites, improve their uh, uh, performance as well. Uh, there is, this is a recurring theme in our report, but this one's a particularly good one. Permitting is nightmarish for everything. Connecting to the interconnect queue, getting a tra CO2 transmission pipeline out, building a new port, any of these things. Gosh, the permitting is tough. AI can really help generate paperwork, review the paperwork, build some of the things you need, like a power flow model or something like that, to get the job done. So we are finding all kinds of opportunities out there to uh, short circuit uh, the timeline on permitting and also will help with things like community acceptance, which is a sine qua non. We must have it or else if you don't, if the community doesn't say yes, you go nowhere. Uh, so we got to get to these things. Uh, I'm going to really short, shorten this part of the conversation because I've mentioned a bit about it. materials innovation. Again, uh, this guy here, you might have heard of him, Edison. He banged things out one at a time like Santa's toy shop. That won't work. Uh, we are just going to have to get more materials out there. It doesn't matter whether it's a new battery, whether it's a new catalyst, whether what a substitute for steel, 
uh, an alternative material that does the same job as concrete, posilinic materials, like you name it, we need them to get there. Um, the good news is that AI can do a lot in this. It really reduces the computational time on this stuff. Uh, it not only will, uh, one of the, the key applications we found is just going through the literature. There are tens of thousands of materials in any vertical out there. It doesn't matter what it is that people have discovered using AI. Who's going to read those papers? Hey, Chad GPT can read those papers and summarize those subjects uh, quite quickly. Among the recommendations we put in here is that uh, national governments, academia, and private companies should be collaborating on release of these data sets so that uh, more, just because BASF has it in their vault doesn't mean that somebody else might not get value out of it. So we got to be thinking about how to get data out there. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it back to David to talk about the risks involved. Thank you, Julio. We are going to start to wrap up here. Uh, so we spent a lot of time talking about the opportunities, but it's very important to pay attention to the risks of uh, AI as well because they are very real. We divide them into three categories, content risks, safety security risks, and resource risks. Uh, today, I'm just going to talk about the resource risks, and in particular, the greenhouse gas emissions that may come from AI. Uh, and most of our report is focused on how do you use AI to, redu to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but AI can also cause greenhouse gas emissions. And I mentioned this earlier because this is really, um, these points were part of our highlights, but today we, we conclude after looking at the literature that today the emissions are relatively small, that it, the emissions will likely increase in the short term and in the medium and long term could go either way. Uh, we also spend some time looking at data center power demand, which is a very hot topic in the United States today. A lot of concern about the need for power for data centers. Uh, just a few points about this that might be of interest. First, globally, about 1.5% of electricity demand comes from data centers in the US, it's about twice that. An interesting comparison is that 4% of global electricity demand comes from aluminum smelters. So data centers are by, by no means the largest source of electricity demand out there. Um, but that data center power demand is growing fast. We actually have a chart in the report that has about 20 different projections from the past year. It's been a very hot topic. And this Goldman Sachs report is kind of in the middle, projecting 160% growth by 2030. And then a really key point, Maybe I might put this first uh, as we redo these. That really key that the data center demand growth is not coming just from AI. The, and I think these sometimes have got, gotten conflated in the in public dialogue about this. There's a AI is a really important factor in the growth of data center power demand. Uh, the reshoring of manufacturing in the United States has been a very important power demand driver. Electric vehicles, 5G networks, and and more. So to just quickly, we have 12 recommendations in the report. We'll just quickly highlight a few, six of them, I guess. Um, every organization working on climate change mitigation should consider opportunities for AI to contribute to its work. That's kind of at the highest level of generality. If you're working in this space, think about what AI can do. Governments, businesses, philanthropy should fund fora in which AI experts and climate change experts ex jointly explore ways AI could contribute. One of the, I think, our key conclusions looking at this is that the climate community and AI community needs to come together to, to work on this. And by the way, universities are a really important forum for this. I think there's almost no place better than universities pull, to pull together people with high levels of domain knowledge. Uh, AI, I mean, universities have that domain knowledge. Universities have the conven convening capability. They have the prestige. There's a lot that Stanford and other universities can do on this front. Government should assist in developing and sharing data for AI. And companies with data sets relevant to AI should release them if they can. And there's an interesting example about five years ago, Netflix uh, did something called the Netflix Challenge. They anonymized a lot of their data and put it out into the public in order to, and, and gave a prize to whoever could come up with a better recommendation algorithm. And as a result of that, they got a better recommendation algorithm uh, that has actually been dispersed widely. We've been thinking, are there ways that this could work in the energy sector? Are there ways that we can incentivize utilities or other businesses that have lots of data to put them out into the public? And love to engage with anybody who has ideas on that. Um, government should require all data center operators and model, develop model developers to disclose their emissions in power center. You know, in other contexts, such as the toxic release inventory in the United States and um, many other areas, disclosure has been a very important tool. And I think disclosure could be a very important tool here as well. There is 
there was legislation, I guess there is legislation pending in the U.S. Congress on this topic, which I think is not going to go anywhere now. But I think around the around the world, having disclosure obligations for this would make a big difference. Every organization working on climate change mitigation should prioritize skills development, and then we recommend that all government agencies with responsibilities in this area should should have special AI offices as well. Um, I'm not going to go over the five key takeaways again. Uh, oh, this is part of a series of projects, a series of roadmaps that Julio and I actually and some colleagues have been working on together for a number of years. Funded it's funded by the Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry and New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization. Here's important people saying nice things about what we did, which I don't have to get into a lot of detail about, but we're gl very glad they did that. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much for listening. And we would love to hear any thoughts, comments, or questions. Yes. I have a question about your manufacturing slide. So, for example, you said the top three industries is uh, steel, cement, and aluminum. So, my, my question is what incentives do they have to? Reduce their emissions. Is there like, uh, like, because uh, does it help save them money if they, like, what incentives are there to reduce emissions in those manufacturers? So, um, the breadth of applications of AI to reduce the carbon footprint of those sectors is broad. The only ones that have received any adoption to date are the ones that align with cost reduction. So when I go and I talk to plant managers in those sectors, the only thing they want to start conversations with are applications that reduce costs. And we only focus on applications that also reduce their carbon footprint. Once that barrier has been reached, then there's more of an appetite for manufacturers to start exploring other applications of AI that just reduce their carbon footprint may or may not come with a cost benefit, but opening the conversations that way has not been fruitful. Mm -hmm. And so I could, a quick uh, <coughs> addition to, to Alp's point, first of all, the top three are steel, cement, and chemicals, not, not aluminum. Aluminum is about 1% of global emissions, 4% of electricity, but 1% of global emissions. Chemicals is about 6%. So uh, the same as all the cars in the world. Chemicals is equal to all the cars. So this is how big the emissions footprint is. There are other incentives to reduce the emissions. Some of them are things like what's in the bipartisan infrastructure law around the hydrogen hubs, the IRA around things like the 45Q credits or the 45X credits. Um, there are also things punishing pathways, things like the carbon border adjustments mechanism, the CBAM in Europe, which is adds a tariff based on the carbon content. So there are these other incentives out there. That arithmetic is starting to land now. It did not, like nobody really cared about this stuff two years ago. We are getting a lot of inbound from companies in Japan and Korea and Singapore going, oh, God, this carbon border adjustment is something we got to care about now. How can we reduce our emissions? So traditionally, this like, how do I reduce my cost through efficiencies and feedstock improvements and stuff? That's been the lion's share of this work. But as they are looking down the barrel of compliance costs, they may get more interest in other pathways. Uh, could I just follow up? Like when you when you talk to these manufacturers, is there any underlying like most excruciating pain points that? Because like I'm working with like a startup team for manufacturing, so like please. Uh, let's take that offline. There's lots of lots of pain points. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think when a lot of people think about AI, uh, less glossy, they think about like the big economic transformation and concerns. And I wonder how much you have addressed that in this report and how, how you think about that. Uh, I mean, your, your goals are really socially positive, obviously in, in uh, reducing climate change, but the structural shifts, you know, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. But labor market shifts, you mean, and those sort of things? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, count the guys with it. <laughs> yeah, a huge issue. It's not a focus of this report. Yeah. yeah. Focus is, as you guys saw, how do we use it to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Um, one of the reasons it's so difficult to say whether greenhouse, what AI is going to increase or decrease greenhouse gas emissions is the economic transformation you're talking about. I think mm -hmm. we're at a very early stage of the deployment of this transformational technology, which is really horizontal. It cuts across kind of every part of the economy, and how that's going to play out is is very difficult to project at this point. Yeah. There, there's some interesting proposals for rigorous scenario analysis on this, which I it's another role, I think, for research universities and research organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that needs to be done, but the, at this point, that work really hasn't been done. I really resonate with all the main takeaways, and if I can take one minute to share a story, <laughs> my side. So I, 10 years ago, worked with Stefano Armand in computer science at Stanford, and we were really one of the first to look at the intersection of AI and batteries. Mm -hmm. And it's actually taken about 10 years to see this being used in industry, although the science the engineering was all there 10 years ago. Nothing has changed very much. And the challenge there was in the prediction task. The optimization task is very easy because once you find the answer, you can see it. Mm -hmm. But the prediction means the practitioner have to undertake huge risk to accept the prediction. So what we found was that academia and startups have huge role to play here because they're the one who are willing to make, they, they can make the prediction and bet on the prediction. Whereas uh, incumbents are usually very risk averse in relying on the prediction. And it's not until some of these predictions have been tested in academia, in startups, then the big participants begin to say, well, then we should also take on the risk. So the question back to you is, are there ways to maybe assemble these exciting success stories and, and really show that the risks are somewhat modest and that the rewards are very high so that the big actors with the large balance sheet can get into this and start using it in a powerful way, especially for these tasks that comes with a very high price tag to test. Like CO2 capture, for example, it's going to be an expensive experiment to try out the production. That's a question, I mean, it's a really important question, Well, but the story is fascinating. Uh, and it's my first prediction is it's, you know, I think we could do this just by kind of uh, research to gather a variety of success stories, disseminate them in a variety of different ways. Um, but in some ways, it's also it's a question, be, it's a market structure question beyond AI, right? It's what's the, the risk appetite of, of large companies? And I, would, I would hope the companies with large balances, you know, might be willing to take some of this risk. But they'll, they'll probably take the risk in a slightly different way. A lot of these companies with the big balance sheets they would much prefer a mergers and acquisition pathway. They'll wait for somebody else to stumble through the forest for yeah. a decade. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, we will pay $200 million instead of $20 million. They would rather pay 10x to reduce the risk and wait until all other work has been done by somebody else. Um, to, to, uh, I, I do believe that there are companies who are really using AI like inside their shops and we can't see a lot of it. <laughs> Uh, and they are taking those kinds of risks now. But an area that we highlighted that that's not really not happening is in the utility sector. Like it's just so counter to their business model and reward set. They're, they're just not there. Do you want to? Maybe one thing I'll add is, is there's a technical component here, right? Like an example I'd like to give is if, uh, you know, your favorite ride sharing app was slightly off in how long it's going to take for a driver to come pick you up, nothing happens to you. And your probability of quitting that platform is epsilon small. Right, but the actual uh, risk associated with following predictions blindly in these sectors can be huge, and so quantifying uncertainty is a important aspect of encouraging the adoption of AI in these mm. challenging sectors, and that is a branch of machine learning AI that is harder to do, which is why technologies like companies haven't really leaned into it as much. It's still being mostly developed in startups and academia and so on and so forth. So, yeah. What I wanted to add to the discussion is, William, what you pointed out is, can we access the data in DuPo, DAO, BSF, looking to put the constraint on the prediction? Just in a chemical reaction, if you predict something, and then you have to make sure it's a scalable process, can I make it? And that constraint has to be built into that model, and then people will start the prediction, start accepting the prediction much more. Awesome. Yeah, it's a key key component, like all these technical details make a big difference in terms of the ability. That's what we mean by AI being trustworthy and trusted. And, and they're, they're related con you know, concepts, but at the end of the day, you need to satisfy all these criteria for it to be, be there. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, 
quality of time. But we are actually already over time. Okay. But <laughs> well, maybe we should take one or two we'll more questions. Speak. Yeah. Up there. Hi. Um, I'm going to touch on this earlier, but on that topic of uncertainty, how do you think about applying these models in situations like virtual power plants where there isn't a lot of data on things like EV charging or the use of behind the meter resources? Like, how do you think about using these when there just isn't a lot of data available? Yeah, um, all right, so there are branches of machine learning AI that are really designed to work with smaller data. Uh, you have to complement the smaller data with domain knowledge. And so you can either bear prior expectations of what you think should happen under various circumstances and build that into the model, or you can use other existing domain knowledge to simulate data in a way to complement. You know, sometimes these are called kind of physics informed models where there's a a uh, notion of kind of first principles combined with smaller data sets to try to achieve uh, positive outcomes in these small data set regimes. So happy to take that offline as well. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, the, the last thing I'll say to that is uh, simulation works. You, even in these cases where you have limited data, you have, you know where cars go, you know the rate data. There's a lot of data that is relevant to that that you can use to build decent simulations and that those simulations can also advise uh, the the outcomes, you would want to complement that strongly with domain expertise. Yeah. Great point. I will say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.